Hello and welcome to part one of this video series about setting up your Fujifilm camera. Uh, part one of this series will be all about the menu settings for autofocus and manual focus. Part two, which will come out at the same time as part one, will cover the shooting menu, the flash menu, movie, setup, networking USB, and my menu settings. Part three of this series will come out the week after this video and will be about exposure modes and a brief conversation about shutter speed, aperture, and ISO. Part four of this series, also released the week after this one, will be about drive modes and uh, the Q menu and uh, the viewfinder display and what you can see there. So there's a lot in this series. I hope you find it helpful. Uh, if you have questions about things that aren't quite covered here or want some more information, uh, my contact information will be down below or please leave a comment. Uh, before we go any further, I wanna let you know there will be uh, chapter markers in the description below so you can jump to the part of the video that is most helpful to you. So uh, for those of you new to this channel, welcome. I'm glad you're here. I hope you find this very, very helpful. Uh, my name is Michael Sladek. I live in Sammamish, Washington, USA, which is about 25 miles due east of Seattle. Uh, I've been making photos since 1979. Uh, and at that time, my very first camera was the Pentax K1000, or as I like to call it, the Volkswagen Beetle of cameras. I think anybody of my generation, their first camera was very likely a Pentax K1000. Um, continuing the introduction, my very first Fujifilm camera was the X-T1, which I got in 2014. I still have it, still use it occasionally. It's an awesome camera. My current camera is the Fujifilm X-H2S, which I've had since 2022. I think it was July. Uh, I really, really love this camera, enjoy using it quite a bit, and have lots and lots of videos uh, about street photography using that camera. For my work life, my non-YouTube life, uh, I teach photography at Highline College. I've been there since uh, 2011. And uh, on the weekends, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, I work at Kenmore Camera in Bothell, Washington, which is an awesome place. I've been there since September of 2023. So that's just a teeny bit about me, uh, a little bit more about me uh, and why I'm making this video. This video is hopefully for you. I hope you find it helpful in making it. I've learned a few things. So uh, here's why I'm creating this video. Even though I've been making photos for a very, very long time, it wasn't until about the past 15 years that I really started to understand the technical side of photography. For a really long time, I thought my creativity was enough to not need to learn about the technical stuff, that I could just make art and it would be awesome. However, I discovered, as you may be, that not understanding all the ways these complex devices work and how they interact with light, uh, I wasn't able to create all the kinds of photos I wanted to. So I started digging into understanding the technical side and I found it unlocked all these opportunities. Uh, photography is, is both technical, creative, artistic, and those two sides are uh, both in my brain and I, I like learning about the technical to feed the artistic. Uh, an analogy I use is if is about cooking. If the only way you know how to cook is by boiling water and the only seasonings you have is salt and pepper, no matter what you cook, it's all gonna kind of taste the same. But once you learn a little bit more about uh, different cooking methods, you add other seasonings, and all of a sudden now you have a much wider variety of textures and flavors you can create in your food. Learning this technical stuff, I think, is kind of like that. It gives you more options, more variety, more nuance, more textures, uh, more uh, options for the kind of photos you can make. So I hope all that makes sense. A couple more things before we get started, uh, a few points I'd like to make. One, first, while this video is primarily intended for Fujifilm cameras, um, most other camera systems have the same features and settings. They're just in different menus, or they're called something else. So hopefully you can find this helpful. Point number two, even if you have a Fujifilm camera, your menus might look different. Your options that are available, your settings might look different. The camera I'm using for this demonstration is the Fujifilm X-H2S uh, with current firmware as of February, 2024. 
if your camera looks different, it's because it has different capabilities, different firmware, uh, different options and settings. So just be aware of that most of it is, is going to be common, but there might be a few specific things that your camera won't have. Again, if you have any questions on your specific camera, leave them in the comments below or reach out to me on my website contact form. Point number three I'd like to make is get comfy. This is going to take a while. I'm, I've broken this settings menu stuff up into two videos, but this is still going to take a minute or two. So get comfy, grab a beverage, put your feet up, hit the pause button as you need. Uh, point number four, my approach and the way I'm going to do this is to give you a brief explanation of almost everything that is in the menu options and there's a lot of them but I'll try and keep it as quick as I can not dig into the the weeds too much but I want to let you know what the options are so that even if you don't use it today down the road you're like oh yeah I remember he talked about that thing and maybe I can uh, change that setting that will help me do this thing I want to do that's my idea about how I approach this Point number five is that uh, you don't need to change all these settings. Um, my experience is that 80% of the time I only use 20% of the settings approximately. Uh, and then those other times I need the parts I'm not using, I have to look it up. That's just, just the way it goes. Uh, point number six is uh, setting up your camera is very specific to both your personal preferences and the type of photos you're making. So um, the way I set my camera up will likely be very different than yours, and that's quite all right. I'll give you the reasons I'm using my settings, uh, and then hopefully give you enough information to make a decision about the settings that will work best for you. And one more thing before we get started. Um, you're not going to remember all this. I don't remember all this. Uh, we have this wonderful thing called the internet, which can help us be our memory. Uh, I know in uh, preparing for this, I had to go over to the search engine and look up some of this stuff. So here's my strategic suggestion of how to do that. When you head to the search engine, uh, add your camera name, your camera manufacturer. So for me, it's just Fujifilm. And then whatever setting you're look, looking for, like autofocus, pre-AF, magic. Uh, and then that'll give you search results. And the search results, at least in my experience uh, preparing for this, were usually uh, a web page from the camera manual and or uh, YouTube videos with someone uh, walking you through the menu settings, much like this. So I hope you find that helpful. You don't have to remember it all. Um, just remember how to find what you need. I hope that's helpful. All right, let's get started with part one here. We're going to dive into the uh, image quality settings and we're going to dive into the autofocus, manual focus settings. Here we go. So let's get started with the menus, uh, specifically with the IQ image quality settings. There's a whole bunch of options here. We'll walk through them one at a time and I'll give you some thoughts and hopefully some explanation of how this works. So the first menu you come to is this, and the way you read these menus is uh, across the top where it says IQ, the icon on the left, you'll see there's four squares to the right of that with one in red, and that red one is the page you're on. So you're on page one of four. You can also see that to the right where it says image quality setting one of four. So you're going to have four pages of menus, which means when I get to the bottom of this page, which is color chrome effect, that will take me to page two of four. So I'm going to walk through each of these settings and talk briefly about them. Oh, by the way, the way you get here is by hitting the menu button on the back of your camera. So on my camera, it's right here in the middle of the directional pad, the D-pad. So you click that and that will take you to the menu settings that we're talking about right now. Apologies for not saying that first. So the first uh, option we have is the image size, and you're going to see it says L3.2. Uh, Here's what that means. So that means you from these options, the L's are large, which means they're going to be the highest quality image, which has the most megapixels in it, the most dots. Uh, the number to the right of the L, 3 to 2, that's the aspect ratio, the width to height ratio. So uh, in addition to the aspect ratio to the right, you have a number, mine says 9,580. That's the number of photos at that quality setting and size that you can 
save to the current memory card. When you get down to the M, you have medium, and then you get to the S, you have small. I'm not quite sure why the S size is the same number of photos on my camera as the large size. It's a mystery. You'll find there are some of those as we proceed with this. So uh, regarding those sizes, uh, those aspect ratios, the three to two is the standard photo ratio, 16 to nine is a standard ratio for video, and then one to one means a square, or the old way that Instagram used to have photos. Uh, square photos are nice. They're great for symmetry and other types of things. All right, our next decision to make is about image quality. Uh, my setting is F plus raw. We'll talk about what that means. So, so here's your options. Fine and normal refer to JPEGs. We'll talk about that in a moment. Fine plus raw means it'll save two photos every time you click. That means it'll be a fine JPEG plus a raw photo. Again, I'll talk about raw in a second. And then next option is normal plus raw. Again, two uh, photos each time you click. And then the last option is raw, which means just one photo that would be a raw file. So what's JPEG and raw? Let's talk about that for a minute. So uh, JPEGs are uh, nice because they're, they don't really need any editing. Uh, they're going to be small files. They don't take up much space on the, as much space on the, on the camera, memory card, or your computer. Uh, and they already have some edits, for want of a better phrase, built into it. They have some sharpening usually, contrast, saturation. So they look pretty good right out of camera. Uh, Fujifilm JPEGs are uh, somewhat famous for their uh, film simulations, which we'll talk about also later, uh, for having really uh, attractive to most people image quality looks right out of the camera. Uh, the smaller file sizes I've already mentioned. And lastly, these are great for sharing photos. So you can share a JPEG with anybody who has an, any app that can open an image file. So that's nice about JPEGs. The other option we have with JPEGs is the fine and normal. So fine is the highest quality JPEG. They're going to be the best image quality, the largest file size. So that's the trade-off. Higher image quality means your files will be larger and take up more space on your memory card. Normal setting is the standard quality JPEG. So how do you decide which one to use? Here's my thoughts on this. Um, if you're using JPEG, I would use the fine mode. Uh, memory cards are relatively inexpensive now. Uh, you get 128 gigabytes for about $35, sometimes even less than that. And 128 gigabytes is a lot of photos, multiple thousands of photos. So uh, use the highest quality setting. You can always, if you need to, reduce the quality in image editing software for sharing uh, as far as reducing image file size. But if it's lower quality, you can't increase it. So that's my advice on that. So what about the RAW file format? RAW is requires editing. You need to edit your photo because the raw is just the data about the photo with nothing else added to it. Uh, it does have larger file sizes. It has more data about exposure, more data about color. Uh, so it's, it's the highest quality option for originally creating your photos. So just be aware of that. So this is uh, the file format you would use if the maximum quality is what you want in your photos. So again, what? how do you decide between JPEG and RAW? So uh, if you'll notice on my camera, it was F, fine, JPEG, plus RAW. So I actually save two photos every time I click, and here's why. Uh, I only edit the RAW files, and that JPEG for me acts as a backup. I had it happen a few years ago where my uh, hard drive and my backup hard drive both uh, died. The, the data was lost. So uh, for a couple client projects, all I had was my backup JPEGs on that memory card, which I don't erase as frequently. 
as my regular card because it holds more photos. I hope that made sense. Anyway, it's just a good save, peace of mind. Most uh, A lot of modern digital cameras have two card slots, so you can save one card slot will have, in my case, the RAW file, and the second slot has the backup, the JPEG. If I remember in a really big hurry and just need to get some photos out quickly, that JPEG will work nicely. If I have more time, which is most of the time, I will import the RAW file and use that as my editing base. And then when I save it to share with the world, that becomes a JPEG. It's complicated. If you have questions, comments below. All right, we got, if you've uh, decided to make a RAW photo, you've got another decision to make. And that is about how the RAW files will be saved. As I mentioned, RAW files are larger. They take up more space on your memory card and on your computer when you save to your computer. So you have some options here. There's three of them. You have uncompressed, which is the default option, which means that will be the largest file. So lossless compressed means as the camera is saving the photo, it is doing an algorithm, a formula, to make that photo take up less space on the memory card. And the way it's doing that doesn't lose any of the photo data. So it's a medium size, a little bit smaller file than uncompressed. And then you get to the compressed raw file, which would be the smallest kind of raw file you can have, uh, but it will be compressed, which means some of the data in that raw file will be lost, but it probably won't be noticeable. So another Michael moment here. Uh, how do you decide what to do there? Uh, I choose the middle option. I use lossless compressed. It saves some space on my memory cards. Uh, but be aware, it does take a little more time in processing, saving the photos to the card. Not a lot, maybe half a microsecond or whatever that amount is. Uh, but it is a little more time on the computer, especially Lightroom, uh, the software I use for editing. Uh, it does take a little bit longer in reading the original file as it's imported to the camera for a preview. I mean, into the computer for a preview. So what does this mean for file sizes? Um, an uncompressed RAW on my Fujifilm X-H2S, which is 26 megapixels, is around 40 to 50 megabytes, so a pretty large file. Uh, the lossless compressed is around 30 megabytes to 40 megabytes, sometimes just a little less than that. And then the compressed file would be, again, probably about another 10 to 20% savings on that. Another quick note on this. Uh, most computer operating systems, at least on my Macintosh and the PCs I've seen, the Windows computers, will not show you a preview of the lossless compressed or compressed RAW file. Most of them can see a, show you a preview of the uncompressed RAW. I hope that made sense. So just be aware if you, if you download your photos to the computer and it just is a generic icon, uh, that's because it's a, a lossless compressed or compressed RAW file. I told you this was going to be nerdy and it was going to take a while. So I hope that helps. Um, if you uh, use a JPEG, uh, you have one more option to choose, and that's between JPEG, J-P-E-G, and H-E-I-F. I don't think people are, announce, are pronouncing that as a word, hyph, I don't know, maybe. Uh, here's what that means. So uh, JPEG has been around for a long time, from 1992. It stands for Joint Photographic Experts Group. And it's the most compatible image file format. It's been around for a while. And uh, just about any program that can work with image files can work with a JPEG. It's the most common, it's the universal translator of image file formats. HEIF is much newer. It stands for High Efficiency Image Format. It came out in about 2015. And it has the same quality as JPEGs, but a little bit smaller file sizes because it's leveraging the power of the computers we have, which is orders of magnitude much more powerful than the computers in 1992. So HEIF is very common. Uh, I would say 90 to 95% of programs that can support JPEG will now also support HEIF. But uh, just be aware that uh, it uh, may not. So check your, uh, do a test before you do anything mission critical. One of the things I mentioned when we were talking about uh, JPEG versus RAW and the need to edit 
raw, but not necessarily JPEG, is this part about film simulations. So film simulations uh, are Fujifilm's magic recipe for creating looks that look like old film stock. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of options here. I'm not going to go through all of them. This is a uh, very specific to each camera model. Uh, the newer camera you have from Fujifilm, the more uh, film simulations you will have built in. For example, my camera is missing one of the film simulations from the latest GFX, but um, there you go. So it's, it's just the way it works. So uh, the film simulation I m use most often is called Classic Chrome. Um, and I really like the way that looks. It fits my style. Uh, I suggest you take a look at them. As you select each option here, it will show you a preview on the screen of what that uh, will look like as it applies to whatever your camera is pointing at. So it's a good thing to take a look at and see what you think. Another Michael Minute. Maybe I'll call these nerdy notes. So <laughs> here's the nerdy note here. If you're saving your photos as raw format, the Film simulation will not actually be part of the RAW file. So when you open it in your image editor, you will not see the film simulation applied. I know in Adobe Lightroom, I have to go to a separate part, to a profile, to apply it uh, into my image editing software. So you'll see it as a preview in uh, the viewfinder on the back screen. And when you look at the photo in your camera, because that's showing you a JPEG preview of the RAW file, and uh, but you will not see it when you get to your editing software or at least in adobe lightroom classic i believe capture one might include uh, that film simulation applied as you import it something else to check out in your world back to the slideshow next uh, notice after film simulation monochromatic color is uh, not an option to select. It's grayed out. The reason for that is because the film simulation I have is a color film simulation. If I had one of the black and white film simulations, that would give me some options of what I do with the different colors here. So I'm not going to cover that in this presentation. Uh, next after that is grain effect, which is um, adding film grain look to your photos to make it look a little less digital. You have some options here. You can make it strong or weak or turn it off. And then you have an option for size, how large you would like that grain effect, each grain to be in the grain effect. Next, we have the color chrome effect. Uh, this one's a little confusing and hard to explain. I'll do my best. Um, basically, we have three options here, strong, weak, and off. What the color chrome effect does is add some saturation to the less saturated colors in the image. That's my best explanation. Um, do a Google search for it and see uh, there's some visuals that might be helpful. Um, but the short version is uh, in my photos, I do that when I edit the photo, when I'm uh, in my software for editing. So I add that if I want it in each individual photo. So I, I just leave that off in my photos. But again, if you're using JPEGs for creating the photos that look the way you want without any additional editing, you might try this out. The colors, especially the blues, might have a little more pop, a little more saturation. Uh, speaking of the blues, there is a special selection, uh, an individual selection for just doing color chrome effects on blue. So again, you could turn that off or on. Next, we have white balance, which is the color of light, the overall color temperature of the light in your photo. Uh, I leave mine on auto because the camera does a good job of this. Um, there are different color temperature settings for different light sources here that you can choose uh, depending on the specific light source you're in. Uh, again, the reason I leave this for auto is because, again, the camera's really good at it. If it's off, it's off by just a little bit. And I, again, because I edit all my photos that I share, I can adjust that in software. Uh, if you are very specific and particular about your white balance needs, you can set your settings for the specific color of light in your scene like I've done here on that camera. So when the light doesn't change, it, it makes sense to use a specific setting. But since I'm often in Sometimes it's shady and then it changes quickly to color, to sun or it goes to, I mean, inside or outside. Um, it's one more setting that I often forget to change. So my white balance is off and then it's another edit I have to make. So 
That's my theory on that. Additionally, here in white balance, you can tune each white balance to have colors adjusted differently. So again, this is another way, in, especially if you're saving photos as JPEGs, you can uh, fine tune and set up your photos to look the way you want as you're creating them in camera and don't need any additional edits. Dynamic range is uh, also a little confusing. I'll do my best to explain it. So there's three settings. 100%, 200%, and 400%. What that means is uh, the camera will do its best to adjust for scenes that have a lot of bright and or a lot of dark at the same time. And the higher the number of dynamic range you choose, the more adjustment the camera will make as it's saving the photo. Basically, when your DR is at dynamic range, is at 100, that means it's off. Uh, you can choose your own setting here if you want, or you can leave it on auto and the camera will decide. I leave mine on 100. It works really well. Um, modern cameras have quite a bit of dynamic range in the sensors most of the time that when I leave it at 100, even if as long as I make my exposure about in the middle, I'll talk more about that in part, I guess it's going to be part three when we get to exposure modes. Um, that I can adjust where it's just a little too bright or a little too dark as long as I kind of keep the exposure somewhat in the middle to just a little dark. Hang on for that part three of this video series. So uh, again, try different settings here. Uh, experiment a little bit, see what works best for you. So the D range priority, that's dynamic range priority. Um, again, this one's really confusing. I read a little bit about it and to be honest, I quite don't understand it, uh, exactly how it works or why I would use it, so I leave it off. <laughs> Feel free to do a, an experiment as you would like. I'm going to skip over tone curve, color, and sharpness because those are, again, additional ways you can set up the camera in every photo it saves to have some different settings to the photos. It's basically like pre-editing so that your photos look the way you want around tone curve, which is uh, brightness levels across the dark areas, the mid-tone areas, and the bright areas. Uh, obviously, color is about sh color, and sharpness is about how detailed the photo is. So I'm going to skip those because they're very specific for each person, and it would take a whole conversation to really talk about them. So I'm trying to keep this semi-short. All right, let's skip down to high ISO noise reduction. ISO is the electronic amplification of your sensor sensitivity to light. And as you do that, you're adding noise, grain to the image. I know there was that whole grain thing earlier <laughs> where some people add grain to their photos. And then down here, you have the option to remove some of the grain. I know it's confusing and contradictory at times, but you have all these options. It's very cool. So high ISO noise reduction. Uh, you can let the camera do this. Uh, again, you can include this in the, the photo data for every photo you make, or you can leave it at zero, which is what I do. Uh, clarity is, uh, we're on page three now of the settings uh, menu here. Uh, clarity is uh, sharpness and contrast in the photo. It's hard to explain. Uh, again, I leave this at zero. Personally, I do this in software as I need for each individual photo. It's too much of a pain, in my opinion, to come in here and change it for each photo or each different situation. Uh, so I leave it at zero and I do that in my software for each photo as it needs it. What a long exposure noise reduction does if you turn it on is this. So if you turn this setting on, when you have a, a, a long exposure, uh, and I believe that's probably one second or longer, what will happen is the camera is actually going to make two photos. So you want to be on a tripod for this. Well, you want to be anyway with one a second. Otherwise, you'll have unintended blurriness motion in the photo. So the reason for two photos is it looks at basically the differences between the two photos and the things that are the same and finds basically the noise and it tries to cancel it out as it's saving the one final image. So again, I do this in software as I need uh, and if I'm doing long exposures, uh, they're usually 20 to 30 seconds. So instead of 
then it would double the time. So it might be 40 to 60 seconds. And I don't have that much time, <laughs> even when I'm making long exposures. So uh, I leave this off. Again, software has gotten really good at noise reduction. So if, I, if a photo needs it in particular, I will uh, turn it off, um, reduce it in software as needed. Next, we have the Lens Modulation Optimizer. Sounds like science fiction, doesn't it? <laughs> so here's what this is. It's kind of a little bit of magic. It's kind of a little bit of uh, computer processing because every lens has issues. Uh, a lot of lenses will have some vignetting, so darkening of the corners. Wide-angle lenses might have some distortion around the edges uh, of the photos, especially of straight lines. Uh, longer telephoto lenses might have a different kind of image distortion. So what this lens modulation optimizer does is it, it knows about those technical defects and will adjust it as it's saving the photo to your memory card. So it's a bit of magic. Uh, I usually leave it on. Uh, Fuji's does a good job of uh, describing those problems to then allow them to be minimized as the photos are being saved. Again, turn it on, turn it off, try to different options, see how it looks with the lenses you use in the photos you make. Next, some more nerdy stuff, the color space. How are we defining the individual dots of color? Uh, there's two basic options here, sRGB and Adobe RGB. RGB stands for red, green, and blue, which are the three colors that are uh, absorbed of light and then combined to simulate all the colors that we see. So which one is best? Short version here, short version hopefully. Uh, sRGB is the color of screens. Uh, particularly, it's the color of the web spaces, the web color spaces. So if, if that's going to be your place where your photos end up, sRGB is a good place to go. Adobe RGB is designed primarily for printing. Um, so if you've ever had a photo that looks great on your screen and you print it and it looks so different as far as colors and brightness, that's the issue. Um, again, it's a whole video, a whole art and science about color science, uh, color spaces and color management. It's complicated. Um, so uh, sRGB has a few less colors in its crayon box, so to speak. Uh, Adobe RGB has more colors. I do sRGB uh, because most of my stuff ends up on screen. Actually, as you send to a lot of printers anymore, uh, if you have your photos printed somewhere else, or if you're sending to a printer in your closet like mine is over there, the sRGB color space I found works really well. Uh, I haven't noticed a limit in the colors I'm able to print in my photos because of using this. So again, I just leave it like that because 99 times out of 100, what I'm seeing on my screen, both on the back of my camera and on my computer screen, matches really closely what I'm seeing if I print. And for sure, it matches what I see on my phone or my tablet, or another screen. So I think it's just the most predictable for screens. There you go. Next up is pixel mapping. The reason you might use this is if you ever notice either a hot spot or a dead spot on your photos. What that means is uh, like a hot spot will oftentimes show up as a single red uh, dot on your, or a color dot, red, green, or blue, in your photo. That means something's wrong with that pixel that captured the image. And the pixel mapping will try and find any of those and adjust for it. So that's an option. If you ever notice little, a single oftentimes a dot in your photo that's a color that shouldn't be there or is black where it shouldn't be, you can use this to see if that helps. Next is the edit slash save custom settings. What is this all about? This is all about uh, if your camera has custom menu options. I have seven custom menu options that I can dial in on my X-H2S. So it's on the top dial of my camera that I can adjust that. Uh, different Fujifilm cameras, different other cameras will have less than that usually. But what each of these custom settings are is a preset set of 
All the camera settings, every menu option I've talked about so far and will continue to discuss in the future videos, you can save all those as a single package to one of these buttons. So if you have multiple different things like I have here, I have BRKT MNL, which is bracket manual. Talk about bracketing when we get to drive mode. Uh, part three of the video or part four. Oh, anyhow, one of the future ones. Uh, I have C2 is set up for aperture priority. Again, when we get to exposure modes, I'll talk what that is. Uh, uh, some of these are set up for video. Some of these are set up for photo. So it's really cool. Um, it takes a while to set these up, but it's nice to have these quick ways to get to a specific setting that you setting group that you want. So let me see if I can explain that a little bit more. A metaphor I'll use for describing this is it's it's a preset package of every setting on your camera that we're going to discuss. And there's like two to 300 of them that you can put all together. And with one click or one press or turn of a knob, you can get to all of those at one time. So for me, I have some that are set up for video. I have some that are set up for different exposure modes. And for all of them, I have different image quality settings, manual focus settings, drive settings, exposure settings with one click. It's really cool. It takes a little bit of time to set them up, but worth the investment of time and energy. Uh, depending on your camera, you might have as many as seven custom menu options available by a dial like I do here, or you may have less, or they may be available through buttons that you can assign or are pre-assigned on your camera. Your camera will be different unless you have an X-H2 or X-H2S. The next setting is related to the custom setting buttons and auto update custom setting. What that means is when you're in the custom setting, if you make a setting change, so let's say I'm in my one of my video settings and I change to auto exposure, that custom setting, let's say it was C4, now has auto exposure applied to it, even though when I created it, it may not have it may have had manual exposure again hope that makes sense the custom mode setting what that is is each of the custom modes can be a, a photo or a video mode so you can see on mine the the c1 c2 c3 and c6 are photo c4 5 and 7 are video so that means as when i push the shutter button i'm either making a photo or a video uh, page four of the menu, we're on to the mount adapter setting. That is if you're using a lens that does not have electronic contacts to talk to the camera. So maybe it's an old vintage lens that's been adapted or it's a, a manual focus modern lens that uh, doesn't have contacts to manually communicate with the camera. You could tell it what focal length it is. So at least uh, that information will, will be preserved in the photo data as you're saving the file. Uh, here you have options for saving up to six lenses, so you can dial that in, uh, different focal lengths if you have them, uh, and then pick each one as you change the lens. All right, so that's the image quality menus. Woo, we're about halfway there. Let's go to the autofocus menus, the AF menu. So here we go. So there's three pages here. So the first one is focus area. So the focus area is represented by all these small white squares on your screen or in your viewfinder. The green square here indicates the area where I've decided I want to focus here. And when it's green, it means it is it has captured focus. So uh, anywhere you see the white squares, the small ones, that is an area that you could potentially focus the camera. So the focus mode, you have three options here for your focus mode. You have manual focus, continuous AF, and single AF. So uh, how do you decide what to do here? Uh, this is very much personal preference. I know a lot of folks who like to do manual focus. I do not. So how do you decide if you're doing autofocus between single and continuous? Here's my thoughts on that. Uh, between continuous autofocus and single autofocus. Continuous autofocus is a good choice when your subject is moving. So maybe it's a flower on a breezy day. Uh, maybe it's someone uh, running away from you or towards you or left to right and you need to 
can keep them in focus. So that means as long as you have the button held down halfway, uh, your shutter button, uh, it'll continue to focus on them as they move around the frame. Single autofocus is great for non-moving things, uh, landscapes, mountains don't move very much, uh, or other things that aren't moving. Uh, again, it's, it depends on the situation. Most of the time I leave mine on continuous because a lot of times I do have things that are either moving in the scene, either in a little ways in the breeze, or they're just moving in the scene. So again, uh, up to you. Uh, and sometimes you want to use continuous, sometimes you want to use single, and sometimes you want to use manual. So the choice is yours. Uh, AF mode, autofocus mode, how would you like it to look at the scene? So you have four options here. Single point means uh, an area that you define in the photo. Uh, maybe it's in the middle, maybe it's in the top left, bottom right, wherever. Uh, you can change the size of that focus square from almost a single dot to a very large area. So that leads us to zone focusing, which is a large area. Uh, which is a little bit faster autofocus mode because it's looking at a larger area and it's finding the focus just in that specific area. Wide and tracking mode is good for uh, combined with AFC autofocus continuous because it will track your subject. So it will follow your subject as it moves around the scene and you don't have to move the focus dot manually. It's pretty cool. And then the all is it just decides which one is best for it. The computer or the camera decides which mode to use best for the given scene. Uh, oftentimes uh, on my street photography stuff, I'm using single point. Uh, if I'm doing events with movement, I will do wide tracking with autofocus continuous. So, so this is pretty easy to change on the fly as you need. Uh, many Fujifilm cameras have uh, a focus switch that's on the front of the camera that's easy to switch. Or again, this is something that can be added to one of your custom menus. So a custom menu setting can have a single point autofocus in one situation, maybe on C1, and then C2 is uh, wide tracking with uh, also continuous focus. So here is uh, a custom settings for AFC. So there's six different options here and you can adjust each of them to your own personal taste. They include tracking sensitivity, speed tracking sensitivity, zone, auto, area, switching. Yeah, so suggestion here is um, there's a few videos on YouTube about this specific topic, and I recommend watching them and experimenting in your use case. Um, this is something that's very, very personal, and everybody has different experiences with the different settings. I'm still trying to figure this out a little bit in different subjects, which setting to use. So it takes some experimentation, takes some practice, uh, and when in doubt, just kind of leave it at the default, start there, and then work forward. So be patient with yourself. This takes a little time. You're working with a computer. So um, there's a lot of options, and uh, a lot of it, which one you choose will depend on your specific situation. Uh, next up is store AF mode by orientation. What that means is the if the focus point is in the top left in a landscape photo, as you switch to portrait, vertical photo, it would also be in the top left. Next up, we have the AF point display. So what that does is turn off or on those small squares that are defining the focus area. Uh, I usually leave that on, uh, although I'm, I might turn it off now because I forgot that was an option to turn that off. So I'm gonna turn that off and see how it goes. And speaking of that, related to that is the next one, which is the number of autofocus points. So you can have a lot of focus points or a whole lot of autofocus points. So the 117 points is uh, a pretty detailed grid across your, uh, your screen, your frame. 425 points is a lot of points. So that means each time you try and move the focus points to get from one side to the other, you have more clicks, more taps, more presses you need to do on the focus selector switch to get you from one place to another. Again, for me, I find 117 points works nicely. Next up, we have pre-AF, and what pre-AF is, 
is whether or not your your camera is auto focusing all the time or not. So as you ima might imagine, it's kind of nice to have that on if you're in a situation where things are moving quickly and you need to the camera be auto focus even before you're ready to push the button. So uh, as you also might imagine, that's going to use uh, more camera power and drain your battery more quickly. So be aware of that. You're trading speed uh, and convenience for a little bit of battery time. So um, again, which one to use? You might turn it off and turn it on and see which one works better for most of the ways you're making photos. So uh, another setting that can be added to the custom package for each custom setting. So you might create a package where that is on and another package where it's off. There you go. Next, we have the AF Illuminator, autofocus illuminator. On most Fujifilm cameras on the front, on my camera here, it's right here. There's a little LED that will uh, help if it's dark, it'll send out a little bit of light and light up the scene so the camera can focus. As you might imagine, that could be distracting, problematic. Uh, so I leave that off, again, depending on your, your situation you might turn that on and try to see which one works best for you. But it's that little light that could turn on when you're when it's dark and your camera needs some assistance to find the contrast to autofocus on. Next up is face eye auto detection settings. So do you want the autofocus to find faces in your photo? Uh, so those are your basic options. You can turn it on or off. And if you turn it on, you have additional options where it can just look for the face or it can find a left eye or right eye. Uh, next up is the subject detection setting. So we just had face detect. This is different in that it's non-people subjects. So the options here for subject detection are on or off. And then what kind of subject do you have? An animal, a bird, auto, you can read them here. Uh, so those different types of subjects you could predefine and say, oh, I'm going to be out looking for birds, so I'm going to have it autofocus assist and help me focus automatically on the birds. And it, my experience is it does a pretty good job. Next up, we have the AF plus MF. So here's what this means. When your camera's in autofocus, you can still manual focus with the focus ring on your lens if this is turned on. So if, if I'm just doing autofocus with a half press and I turn my focus ring, nothing happens if this is turned off. If this is turned on, what that means is, you know, try an autofocus and then I can potentially fine tune or assist the autofocus to find the focus by turning the focus ring while I still have the button half pressed. Uh, so lately I've been leaving this turned off. Uh, use cases for when you might turn it on or if you have some kind of tricky autofocus situations. Uh, in my experience, that's oftentimes when you're trying to focus through some tree branches or twigs or things to something beyond it. Uh, it the autofocus might grab on the closer thing, the higher contrast thing. So then you can still do a half press to get you autofocus and then fine tune the focus with the focus ring to focus on the subject you want. Easy, right? You can do it. You are capable. All right, the next uh, setting is the manual focus assist. So if you're doing manual focus as your focus mode or if you're doing AF plus MF, which we just talked about, you can turn on some assistance to help you do that. Uh, so the first one is a digital split image uh, where it'll show you a focus uh, area that is enlarged. And then the second one is, uh, is again an overlay that will help you focus. And then the last one, the focus peak highlight would be areas that are in focus will have a highlight color applied to them. Uh, so you can choose the color that you want um, and how bright it is. So you can go from a white light, uh, color to red, blue, or yellow. Depending on the situation, would we'll choose which uh, color you might use. So if I'm photographing red flowers, it wouldn't make sense to have a red highlight color because the flower is going to show hide that. So again, experiment with this if you're using any kind of manual focus. If you're not, this doesn't apply to you. 
Uh, next up is focus check. What that does when you're in manual focus is the image in your viewfinder or on the back screen will zoom in. And it'll zoom in and enlarge so you can it'll you can make your focus decision more accurately because you'll see more detail. So if you're ever if you have this turned on, uh, or if you wonder why every time you you do um, manual focus it, it the screen gets really big, is this is why because the focus assist is on. Uh, so you can turn it on or off depending on how you like to do things. Uh, and again, if you're using autofocus, this doesn't apply to you. Next is to interlock the spot, auto exposure, and focus area. That means wherever you focus is where it will also determine auto exposure settings for brightness. So I think sometimes that makes sense. Most of the time it makes sense that wherever you're focusing is the part of the photo that's most important. So you wanted to make uh, exposure, brightness decisions about that. Next up is the instant AF setting. Here's what that is. So if you're in manual focus, so you've set your camera to focus manually, so you're gonna use the focus ring to set the focus. Even if you're in manual focus, what this means is there's, a, there's also uh, an auto focus button on the back of the camera. So my camera has an AF on button. So if I push that, what that means is now I'm in auto focus mode even though my camera's in manual focus. It's called back button focus. It's another reason for it, name for it uh, because it's a button on the back of your camera. Uh, so you can push that and even if you're in manual focus, it will auto focus the camera. You have two choices here. Let's go back to the menu. So in this, we have the option to do that to make the camera be in single autofocus, AFS, or continuous autofocus when I push that back button. So um, yeah, so those are your options. Uh, for me uh, personally, uh, I don't use back button focus because I'm a left eye photographer and that back button is now my thumb is on my glasses. So I don't use it. Plus it's a little weird then for me to try and push the shutter button while I'm holding that down. I just can't, I'm not coordinated enough to make it work. Some people love it, not for me. Uh, give it a try. It's, uh, it's kind of a cool way to get the best of both worlds. You can be in manual focus if you like that. And if you're in a situation where you need autofocus right now, you push the AF on or AFL button lock and that'll do that. Options. It's a good thing. Page three of the menu, we have the depth of field scale. Uh, do you want it to show you that information as pixels or in feet or meters? Uh, I just use it uh, by eyeball uh, for uh, depth of field, what's in focus in the photo. Uh, we'll talk about that when we get to exposure modes in part three. Um, I, I don't really use this, so it's something I just leave at the default. Next, we have release and focus priority. Uh, what that means is what happens as you push the shutter button or when will it actually make the photo? It gives you options to change this behavior depending on your autofocus mode. So if you're in autofocus single, you can say, don't make the photo until it's in focus. So I can push the button down as hard as I want, but it won't create a photo until it finds something in focus. Or in this case, the way I have mine set up, if I'm in autofocus continuous, so there's motion happening. As soon as I push the button down the rest of the way, it'll start making photos, even if nothing is in focus. So you can set both of these to be release, I don't care if it's in focus, or both of these to be uh, focus only, so you won't even in AFC make a photo until it's focused. Again, how do you decide this? Very personal, very situation driven, very, uh, you got to experiment to find what feels best for you, what works best for your photo creating situation. So we'll talk a little bit more about this if we come, when we come back to the drive mode, which will be part four of the video series because they kind of interact. So the drive mode is how many photos get taken as you push the shutter button. Is it one photo or is it as long as you hold the button down and how fast does it do it? So all these things connect. You won't remember it all, don't forget about the Google search thing. Next uh, setting for autofocus, manual focus is the AF autofocus range limiter. So 
you have some options here. You can create a custom setting for what distance you want to only have the camera and lens look at for creating focus. What this does is obviously it can speed up autofocus because it's not looking from zero to infinity, but maybe from, in this case, two feet to infinity. So it just starts a little ways away from your camera or five feet, or in this case, meters to infinity. Again, these options are good depending on specific situations. But one thing to be aware of, if you set one of these, like say you set it, I'm only gonna focus from five meters, which is about 15 feet to infinity. So that means anything closer to you than 15 feet, it can't focus on. So if you're ever wondering, why is my camera autofocusing, even though I'm in autofocus? This is one thing to check to see that you've set it either on purpose or accidentally so that it can't focus in whatever range you're trying to focus because it said, I'm not gonna look at that anymore. Obviously, when it's set to these ranges, again, it speeds things up, but it can be something that could trip you up down the road if you set it and forgot you had set it and then wonder why your camera isn't autofocusing as you expect. And the last setting in autofocus and manual focus is the touch screen mode. So most uh, modern Fujifilm cameras, I think starting with the X-T3 neighborhood, uh, have a touch screen on the back and you can turn it, uh, tell it what to do when you touch the screen. You can have it be for actually making the photo like you're pushing the shutter button. You can have it be for autofocus or for area or turn it off completely. Again, for me, uh, so for me, I turn a touch screen off uh, as convenient as it can be. For me as a left eye photographer, that means my nose is on the screen, sometimes accidentally making photos when I don't want to or focusing where I don't want it to. So I just turn it off. But your mileage may vary. So it's a handy feature to have and that's where you set it. All right, so that completes part one. Oh my goodness, you've made it. Uh, I hope uh, it all makes sense. Uh, and if you do have any questions, please leave one in the comment below. I'm also going to leave a uh, contact a link for me if you want to send me an email to ask maybe a longer question. So we're going to move on to part two next, which will be the shooting menu, the flash menu, the movie menu, uh, the settings menu, the setup menu, and the networking menu, and the my menu. There's a whole bunch there, but it'll go a little quicker. All right, so I hope to see you in that video soon. Bye. For now.